Two houses built on top of opposing mountains look over the valley floor below. From the back porch of their three-story vacation home, the easterly-facing neighbor looks to her partner with disdain and says, If those houses had been there when we were looking for a second home, I would have never agreed to this one. They've ruined our view. At the same time, the westerly-facing neighbor glances up from her computer to look at the row upon row of cookie-cutter mansions on the opposing mountain, before hitting send on an email to the realtor who sold her the home, requesting it be put back on the market because the town is just too developed. The spirit that initially attracted me to this place is gone. Meanwhile, down in the valley below, a fifth generation resident sits at his kitchen table in a double wide trailer, silently staring at his property tax bill and wondering how he could have been deemed so land rich while remaining cash poor. At the end of his rope, he stares out at the mountains, at all the homes he will never be able to afford, and at the defiled mountainside that had once called his family to settle the area. That's it, he says. I can't do this anymore. You can have it. Another house for sale. So this scene with the three houses in the mountains was illustrated in the introduction of a 2019 study I found in the Kentucky Law Journal by Matt Payne of University of Kentucky. It's called When Nowhere Becomes Somewhere, and it discusses gentrification and its impact on rural communities, which is vastly different than its urban counterpart. Payne writes that, though anecdotal, this scene represents an increasingly common experience in rural communities across the world, where long-term residents are priced out of their homes due to cultural and economic changes that culminate in a rapidly increasing tax burden paired with a loss of cultural identity. So we know this phenomenon colloquially as gentrification, and it's typically thought to take the form of middle and upper class people buying up property in historically lower working class neighborhoods and injecting them with enough capital to effectively push the lower class out. We see this happening more and more frequently in cities across the nation, especially in places like San Francisco and Washington, D.C. Um, D.C., as an example, has an extremely high rate of gentrification, especially in neighborhoods like Columbia Heights, Noma, Navy Yard, and the northern edges of Capitol Hill. The rate of gentrification of the city tracks closely with when the city emerged from the financial crisis of the late 1990s. In 1999, the district elected Tony Williams, who would serve as mayor for the district for two terms from 1999 to 2007. And he put into place several of the policies that led to DC's significant growth over the next decade. According to the Washington Business Journal, he brought some $40 billion of unprecedented capital investments and service improvements to the city. This included the arrival of DC's new baseball team, the Washington Nationals, one of Williams' biggest wins during his stint as mayor. Tony Williams' tenure as mayor has been highly appraised by the policy community and historians alike, with MSNBC branding him one of the best and most successful mayors in U.S. history. It is without question that Williams' effective economic stewardship during his two subsequent terms as mayor played a major part in laying the groundwork for the district's current booming times. But that surge in growth has also brought with it the sort of problems that other cities might not envy quite as much, with questions around displacement and gentrification roiling D.C. politics. So as I mentioned, we can expect to see these political, economic, and cultural changes happening at the local level in rural and suburban communities as well. Though the manifestation of gentrification looks very differently in these settings, and it has a lot more to do with land and the value of it and it kind of changing hands and increasing taxes, which as we discussed, pushed out 
um, the lower income residents. As the community kind of becomes a more desirable place to live as developers come in and invest into the community. So it's against this backdrop that we must view the Delphi murders because the city of Delphi was undergoing rural gentrification at a very rapid pace starting in 2012 when they were deemed a stellar community which initiated a 23 million dollar uh, multi-state agency funded so improvement project of the city of delphi now the town can focus on its economic development opportunities attracting people to be here and starting to move the town forward we're heading into really a new era. It's kind of the renaissance for Delphi. Many people are returning, people who were born here. That is coupled with people who see it for the first time and would like to move here or invest money in the community, or just come for a weekend for the entertainment and enjoy the Canal Center and all of the other amenities that we have in town. So I think it's quite interesting that this project wraps up in October of 2017, just eight months after the murders of Delphi's daughters in February. Um, and it, it kind of stuck out to me watching that clip, how there's this heavy push for investing into the community and attracting visitors, weekend visitors, um, because both of those things, investments, funneled into the city, as well as thousands of people coming to visit the city in the form of macabre tourism or coming to pay their respects to Abby and Libby, both of those things happened as a result of the Delphi murders. So we must consider all of this within context as it sets the scene for what we're talking about. Well, the community, of course, would like to have the um, the the trail finished, you know. It has to be fixed and stabilized. It's in a critical condition. Delphi residents say this Monon Bridge is an important gym in the history of their community, and they are asking for the city's help to restore this historic walkway. It's a, it's a very long bridge. It is uh, in very good shape, except for this one pier. The bridge is deteriorating, which makes it dangerous to walk on. In order to fix it, the entire project will cost around $300,000. The community uh, came together to uh, support getting a grant from Indiana DNR that would uh, allow for the decking and railing of the, uh, of the bridge for pedestrian use. McCain was involved in helping to write the grant to the state's Department of Natural Resources, and the Deer Creek Township was approved the maximum amount of $150,000 toward making improvements. They also received $37,000 from the township, but that doesn't cover the bill. Before these changes can be made, the first pier must be repaired, which would cost around an additional $100,000. We don't want the bridge to fail and collapse. We want to be able to fix it. The bridge is owned by CSX, and before any repairs can be made, it must be approved by the owner. After negotiating for more than two years, CSX has agreed to donate the bridge and $37,000 for the project to a nonprofit organization willing to take the responsibility. But before repairs to the Recreational Trails project begins, the bridge must find a new rightful owner. Report so what you need to know is these people are all interconnected with their financial and political motivations. So with that in mind, I'm going to read this guest opinion that was posted in January 2016 by Delphi resident Greg Terry. And this is in response to this news report by David McCain. Um, who you should know has vested interest in this property, and, and you'll see in a minute. Um, so Mr. Terry says, in regards to the uh, guest opinion from David McCain about the Monon High Bridge, I find it difficult to imagine that anyone in their right mind would be truly interested in assuming the financial responsibility and liability that would go along with this piece of property. McCain states that there is no local or state group willing to come forward to claim or sponsor the temporary ownership of this bridge. I wonder if this is because they understand that this is a no-win proposition. McCain states that the CSX Railroad is ready to release or transfer ownership of the bridge, but that it must be to a nonprofit organization so that CSX Railroad can release a tax benefit from or can realize a tra tax benefit from this transfer. Now, the irony of this transfer is so that CSX Railroad can reduce its tax liability. You know, that same tax liability that you and I have to pay, that same tax liability that is the source of funds for the grants that McCain is attempting to secure for this refurbished bridge. 
McCain states that no more than 300,000 will be needed to restore the high bridge. I'm of the personal opinion that 300,000 would in all likelihood do nothing more than refurbish the upper deck and my best guess is that the total cost for the pier stabilization would probably be closer to 1.5 or 2 million dollars. So that's interesting because if you look, in 2019, the Monon High Bridge received state funding of $1.2 million to be used for its restoration in adjacent trails. Mr. Terry goes on to write that, Now I won't say that there is any type of fraud or misappropriation involved, but I wouldn't be surprised if there is. I wonder how many of the taxpayers in Carroll County realize that some of their tax dollars that were intended for road and highway maintenance have been diverted to be used for the relocation and rebuilding of some of these old iron bridges here in Carroll County. Now, it's not that I am anti-history or I am against the Canal Association in any way. I just feel that given the sorry state of the roads and highways in Indiana, that tax dollars collected for that purpose should be used the way they were intended. Um, he goes on to state that now if McCain is able to secure 100% donated non-taxpayer funded finances and he can find some private entity to assume liabilities so that the county and county taxpayers are not held liable, I say great, go ahead and proceed. But this is such an incredibly poor idea and I doubt that anyone is willing to do that. So when you consider that two families own most of the land north of the creek that is needed for development of this trail system and all this expansion they're trying to do, except for the property where the bodies were found, it raises the question, and I know this sounds crazy, but when you think about how everyone's so connected, we have to consider, did someone or a group of someone's dump the bodies where they did in order to frame the property owner? who does have a criminal history, then when he goes to jail and his property's up for grabs, it's up for development. It's a theory, especially when you consider that the property owner was dressed like this the following day for his media interview. Could the guy on the bridge be imitating Mr. Ron Logan? I mean, it's worth, it's worth considering. I think at this point in the case, we are not discounting anything. So I wanted to put that out there. Let me know what you guys think. So follow the money, connect the dots, and be very wary of every individual in this town. Because no matter how hard you try to clean this place up, it will remain deceased and decrepit Delphi, like a demerit on the report card of American history, a symptom of so many problems in our society. A town whose innocence and soul was lost long before that afternoon in 2017, and has no hope of returning to the small town on the banks of Deer Creek.